Good morning, and welcome, everyone. I am touched and honored by the extraordinarily warm welcome that has been extended to me by all members of the Hamilton community and by the comments of those who have preceded me on today's program. I owe too many debts to too many people to thank them all today, but I know you will forgive me if I mention a few. Kareem, I know you're the real president of Hamilton College, <laughs> but thank you for letting me use the office. I want to also thank Steve Sadoff for his extraordinary service as chair of the Hamilton College Board of Trustees. I wish my parents could have been here to hear Steve's introduction. My father would have loved it. My mother would have believed it. <laughs> Let me also thank the family and friends who have found their way to Clinton today. I confess that a few of them expressed some uncertainty as to the precise location of the college, but I'm happy to have provided an occasion today to resolve that question. I owe a special debt of gratitude to my 19 predecessors in the President's office, and in particular to President Joan Hines Stewart, who has been a fabulous resource for me from the moment I was named to this position. Special thanks to Vice President Walter Mondale. As you know, he is one of the greatest of the greatest generation, a Korean War veteran, Minnesota's youngest attorney general, U.S. Senator, Vice President of the United States, Ambassador to Japan, diplomat, author, and statesman. He is best known, of course, for his service on the 2008 Minnesota Law School Dean Search Committee. <laughs> It's a great honor to be named President of Hamilton College. As I reflected about what I should say today, I thought I might find inspiration in our political leaders. <laughs> so I watched the acceptance speeches at the Democratic and Republican National Conventions. And I thought, how hard can this be? All I need to do is make extravagant and completely unrealistic promises. <laughs> but then I remembered I had already done that during the presidential search process. <laughs> so let me instead say a few words about Hamilton's past, its present, and what we might achieve together in the years ahead. All of us understand that our alma mater cannot stand frozen in time at the moment of our graduation. Yet when we return to the campus years later, it's natural to feel some disappointment to find that the college has, in fact, changed. Alexander Wolcott, a 1909 graduate and prominent literary critic, described his own return to the Radiant Hillside in 1932 in a way which, if a little tangential to my theme, may nonetheless strike a chord. My visit, he said, observed all the approved formalities, including a football game, some hours at choir practice with one of the finest choruses in the country, and a few calls at one faculty house where they go in rather more violently for string quartets than I find altogether restful. <laughs> Wilcott added that his, my visit to the Hill was marred by only one serious mishap. After the first quarter in which the scores stood Rochester 7, Hamilton 0, the silence in our grandstand was broken by a solitary burst of applause. It came from your correspondent, who, as it turned out, had watched the game that far under a slight misapprehension as to which team was which. <laughs> I mention this because many of you will be going to the football game later this afternoon. Just to be clear, our players are the ones in blue. The present generation of undergraduates, Wilcott went on, have a rather more luxurious life than we knew. A reminder that we tend to judge the past by our own memories of the present. I'm sorry, we tend to judge the present by our own memories of the past. I want to talk a little bit about some of the differences, with particular reference to student activism at Hamilton and around the country. In its early years, as described in Professor Morris Isserman's Magisterial History of the College on the Hill, Hamilton was very much a product of his times. It was all male and all white. Students were drawn almost exclusively from upstate New York. There was no admissions office, 
Prospective students appeared on a given day to be examined by the faculty. Those who passed started class immediately. Those students may at times have felt a little isolated, but in fairness, the stagecoach to Utica ran on both Tuesdays and Fridays. <laughs> For over 100 years, the college followed a classical curriculum, lots of Livy and Cicero, and a little arithmetic and geography. Tuition was $30 a year for upperclassmen, $21 a year for freshmen and sophomores. Students got up at 5.30 in the morning and attended chapel at 6. Meals consisted on a rotating basis of boiled meat, roasted meat, and hashed meat. <laughs> Weather permitting, students could bathe in Oriskany Creek. Otherwise, they had to haul their own water up from the campus well. Of course, students had the offsetting benefit of daily lectures in the chapel from the president. <laughs> this is a tradition long since discontinued. <laughs> Though whether that is to the greater relief of the students or the president is unclear. From the outset, the college had strong views about moral education. Azel Bacchus, the college's first president, stressed the importance of inculcating religious and moral principles and he condemned light reading and gaseous information. We're still not fond of gaseous information, <laughs> but beyond that, President Bacchus would find little he would recognize in today's Hamilton. Tuition is just a bit higher, <laughs> chapel attendance is not what it was, and Livy and Cicero, though still taught in the classics department, no longer dominate the curriculum. We do still care about values, but our approach is a little bit more nuanced than it was in Azel Bacchus's day. Of course, it is not now and never has been the role of the college to urge any particular set of political views, quite the contrary. But as a colleague and friend observed at commencement ceremonies in Minnesota last spring, politically neutral does not mean value free. Our values are implicit in our mission and our mission is to prepare students for lives of meaning, purpose, and active citizenship. We want our students to learn to think independently, to embrace difference, to write and speak persuasively, to engage issues ethically and creatively, so they can make a positive difference in the world. Stated in the abstract, this mission attracts broad support. But what does it mean to prepare our students to think ethically, to embrace difference, or to be active citizens? The devil is in the details, and if you don't mind my mixing my metaphors, when push comes to shove, there is a lot of pushing back. Let me give you two examples. Last spring, Hamilton adopted a new diversity requirement. The new policy mandates that all Hamilton undergraduates take at least one course as part of their major, dealing with issues of structural and institutional hierarchies. Why adopt such a requirement? Whatever their backgrounds, our students now live, work, study, and socialize in a diverse, multicultural, global community. They will learn more and fare better now and after they graduate if they understand the ways in which social relations can be structured by perceptions of groups and group identities. Encouraging students to embrace difference is something the college believes essential to a contemporary liberal arts education. A second example. In recent years, students at Hamilton and around the country have protested various forms of injustice on issues ranging from police misconduct to sexual assault. In some cases, these protests have included demands that colleges and universities do more to create an environment on campuses that is safe and welcoming for all students. Supporters have praised students for tackling larger social issues, including institutional racism and other forms of bias. Critics have decried perceived threats to free expression and the open exchange of ideas. In a much publicized letter to incoming freshmen, the University of Chicago announced this fall that it does not support trigger warnings or intellectual safe spaces. Some, like the Heritage Foundation, declared that the letter made them want to stand up and cheer. Others suggested the letter was a publicity stunt, a way of coddling donors rather than students. So what's going on? It's certainly possible to find things to caricature in some of the demands made on various campuses. But there's something much more fundamental than occasional student excess at play in recent debates about campus activism. Our students are living and studying in a much different world than most of us encountered when we were in college. 
They no longer haul wood and water. The food is a lot more varied than boiled, roasted, and hashed meat. And the curriculum and campus environment are incomparably richer and more diverse. That's all to the good, but it means our students must navigate differences in ways that few people in our society are accustomed to doing. As two college presidents, Barry Glasner and Morton Shapiro, put it in a recent op-ed, students today arrive from communities and K-12 systems that are largely segregated by race and income. But while on campus, a daughter of a hedge fund parent may room with a daughter of a migrant worker. A straight Republican may share a room with a gay Bernie Sanders supporter. Everyone is here, and everyone lives together, if not in perfect harmony. Even as our students navigate their new lives on campus, the outside world confronts them with a string of tragedies, both national and international. Police shootings and shootings of police, terrorism at home and abroad, metastasizing wars and streams of refugees. As they try to make sense of all this, our national political discourse continues to deteriorate. I can't remember a presidential campaign this course, even though I know, and our namesake could attest, that it has at times been just as bad. In the midst of all this, is it any surprise that our students protest some of the injustices they see? And surely, we want them to care, and we want them to speak out. So why has there been so much criticism when they do? Much of the criticism stems from a perception that contemporary students are intolerant of views that don't align with their own, that they try to silence other students, denounce faculty and administrators, and disinvite or shout down outside speakers who don't toe a politically correct line. And no doubt that has sometimes been true. Indeed, concerns over intolerance for dissenting viewpoints led the Hamilton faculty to adopt the following statement. Free inquiry and free expression are indispensable to the attainment of those goals to which Hamilton College is dedicated. All members of the college community should be free to examine and discuss all questions of interest to them, to express opinions, and to question, but not suppress, the opinions of others. It's a good statement. It's also five decades old. It was adopted in 1967, another period of political turmoil and frequent campus protests and its commitment to free expression remains as important as ever. I don't mean to suggest that nothing has changed. The Knight Foundation recently surveyed college students and adults in the United States about free expression on campus. It found that students are actually more likely than adults to say that colleges should expose them to all types of speech and viewpoints. But students, especially women and students of color, are also more likely than adults to support restrictions on speech if it is intentionally offensive to racial or ethnic groups. Indeed, some two-thirds of, of the students surveyed supported such restrictions. Evidently, many students are willing, to some degree, to restrict speech in order to foster a positive and respectful learning environment. Students recognize that this approach has a cost. A majority acknowledge that the climate on college campuses may prevent people from saying what they think for fear that others will find it offensive. Even, with, even if we disagree with that approach, as I do, we should acknowledge that students are responding to real problems of intolerance and bias on campus and off. We should understand that if we want them to be engaged citizens, their engagement may take them where we are unwilling to go. Most important, we should work together and work hard to create a campus environment in which all students feel welcome and all students thrive. Doing so, in my judgment, means reaffirming our commitment to the full and free exchange of ideas. That is a core value of this college and of liberal arts education. Adhering to this commitment is more likely to lead to the achievement of a just society on campus and off than compromising it in the hope of minimizing conflict. At convocation this year, I emphasized to incoming students the importance of engaging with viewpoints with which they may strongly disagree. I noted that doing so will not always be easy and it will not always be comfortable. But easy and comfortable are not part of our educational mission. Intellectual, social, and moral development are, and they occur when we confront new ideas and consider other perspectives, even if we find those ideas and perspectives uncomfortable. At the same time, our students' desire for a learning environment that supports all of their classmates is entirely laudable. We must do more to foster such an environment 
so that when our students engage with ideas that are difficult or offensive, they can do so in a productive and respectful way. For over two centuries, Hamilton has continuously reinvented itself to meet the needs of a changing student body in a changing world. But one thing hasn't changed. The college still provides a life-changing, transformative education. Oscar Wilde once observed that education is an admirable thing, but nothing that is worth knowing can be taught. But then Oscar Hamilton, excuse me, Oscar Wilde <laughs> never went to Hamilton. In fact, much that is worth knowing can be taught. Our faculty teach it every day. Perhaps it is better still to say that much that is worth knowing can be learned because teaching is not simply the passive transmission of knowledge from the front of the room to the back. It's about enabling students to discover and pursue a passion, about enabling them to change the world. The opportunity to partner with all of you in preparing our students to change the world is precisely what makes my new position so exciting. I look forward to getting to know each of you better and better, to learning from you, and to working with you to make this wonderful college this splendid and special place, ever more splendid and special. Thank you.